five. So the magic happens. Okay, maybe not. You need a. Um... <laughs> I just need a button here. I get hit all the time. Thing is being recorded. Means I did it right. Okay, welcome to today's class, which is focused on saving your buyer money by doing manual septic inspections. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Actually, that's a word of advice. Never borrow a tape measure from a septic inspector because it's been places. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so today's class is called, and I, by the way, I'm supposed to, I'm trying to make sure I go by the flow plan because I have a whole, hi there. Need to sign in? Let me do this over here. first time teaching this one so bear with me you all are my guinea pigs I am Mike Brown I'm supposed to announce that first um, expectations we're gonna try and get through this stuff and make sure we get all your questions answered this is part of the whole ignite program how many of you've been to a lot of the ignite classes so far cool I wish I would have had something like this because I had to just figure things out and try what didn't work and then try again and go from there Make sure that the PowerPoint clicker's going. There we go. So what we're going to focus on today, and I may stay right here so they can hear me online. I'll start moving around a little bit later, hopefully. But we're going to focus on making seller listing presentations and getting listings because we all always talk about the three L's, leads, listings, leverage. Listings make everything go. It is so much easier to list a house usually than drive to 70 different uh residences and sit write an offer and get beat out on bidding wars. So getting listings is the cool thing. And so this is where we're focusing here. Item two on this screen, make seller listings presentations and get listings. Um, also, you already covered some of the basics in the spark session. Some of you that were in that last month on working with sellers, this will build on that knowledge. And if you missed that, everything is recorded and put on our YouTube channel called Rachel Lusk. Isn't that a crazy name we came up with? But if you'll go to that, every class, every team meeting, every everything is recorded there. You can go back and review it all. Okay, so first thing we're going to talk about is what sellers want. We'll look at what they say they want and what they actually want. And the best listing appointments are continuations of ongoing conversations. This is a relationship business. It's not about data as much as we think it is. It's building trust with people. So how sellers found their agents. And those of you that did copy off your your sheets and are looking at them <laughs> you'll have some of these things in front of you also <laughs> um, but basically where sellers found their agents according to research from nar 39 percent of sellers either knew their listing agent or referred to their listing agent by a friend neighbor or relative that is by heart the height of far highest percentage by far of any of these other groups 27 percent of buyers had used their listing agent previously to buy or sell a home so from the moment you start working in real estate, if you sell a house to somebody that's a buyer, stay in touch with them because in three years, four years, five years, they're going to sell that house typically, sometimes quicker. Some people stay in it forever. But if you'll build a relationship and just use command smart plans to stay in touch with them, you will be there when it comes back time for them, you know, you know, send them happy birthday things. You get all that info at closing, you know, their address, stay in touch because that is a big chunk 39% of where people find their agent. Um, other stats on here, 5% chose their realtor after being personally contacted by them. 4% found their agent through a website. 3% found their agent by visiting an open house. Open houses work. Um, my goal used to be sell four houses a year from open houses. I would do two a month. Um, and when you look at it that way, it's worth spending a Sunday here and there because you will get the buyer. And the, I always had three goals out of an open house. Sell that house find a buyer for another house, find a listing for another house. Because sometimes people go through open houses to interview you to look at you know how you're doing things so they can um, go use you for their house. I don't know how many times I've gone to an open house and you'll see an agent sitting there with nothing there. They're sitting there. I've even seen them in flip-flops and like they just came from the beach. You're being interviewed when you're there. So just realize when people come through, that might be a good way to get your next lead. So always be thinking down the road on it. Um, so 22% of this is made up of other methods, like for sale by open houses. Um, so in, and when I looked at this stat the other day, the big thing I looked at was 
this is a big chunk of people that already know who they're going to use. A good enough chunk here that don't. So that's one out of three, basically, if you look at it that way. And just because you're referred by somebody doesn't mean they're going to use you. We had one two weeks ago. We were referred by a good friend. We went over. They did not like the way we were going to do it. So just because you're referred by somebody, the, in other words, there's still opportunities. Don't think that just because there's some experienced agents that are, you know, have a long track record, they ain't always going to go with them. So it's about building a trust, building a relationship with them, and, um, and building off your personality. What sellers want? Okay, so here's what they'll tell us. <coughs> Sorry, I'm looking several different places. Um, they say that these are the things they want. They want someone to help sell, help market their home, help sell the home in a specific time frame, help price the home competitively, help fix up home and sell for more, help find a buyer or other. Nowhere on that are they saying anything about they want someone to help with the transaction, with the paperwork, with all that stuff. So there are things they want and things they don't realize they want, but they also need. So a lot of this, what we're going to be looking at is setting up the whole process to listing and getting them to that. So when you're meeting with somebody, and make sure, I get, again, I got to make sure I stay on the track with this. What do you know about the process of converting a lead to a listing? Anybody, anybody, anybody. How do you do it? How do you process, how do you, what do you know about the process of converting a lead to a listing? Is that a fly or are you raising your hand? Okay. <laughs> you have a lead that has expressed interest in selling their home. There are a few steps you can take to convert them over. This is sort of the guideline that we suggest to do it. There's a pre-listing questionnaire. And if you've got the handouts, I know you don't. <laughs> it should have, you do. <laughs> Phone a friend. <laughs> There's a pre-listing questionnaire where you can ask the potential seller the pre-questionnaire questions to determine their expectations, motivations and how soon they want to sell. Then you schedule a listing appointment. Then there's a pre-listing packet and creating a listing presentation. Now these are the structures. Every time you meet with somebody, it's not always going to be the same. For example, if you walk into somebody, somebody and they say, I need you to come over and we need to list my house right now. Well, no, let me send you a pre-listing questionnaire first. If they're already there, get jumping with them. But you still want to make sure you don't forget to sell your value. I think that's what we did wrong two weeks ago. We just assumed we had the listing. And so we jumped through things and by not following the steps, somebody else got it, sold it in a day. That would hurt because it was $179,000 and actually within several hours they had an offer on it. So by not following and staying with our normal plan, we kind of screwed up and lost an easy sale there. Okay. so. For the listing appointment, you'll do far more listing, far more listening than talking. How many of you have seen Hamilton? Anyone? Anyone? This is my rule of almost everything anymore. Talk less. <laughs> Talk yourself out of clients really easily making it about you instead of about them the more you can listen it doesn't go under there anymore the more you can make it about them that's what you're there for is to serve them and help them with their needs they don't want to know about all your sales all your this all your that unless you're hearing what their needs are you may be telling them things that don't even matter to them so it's all about figuring out what they're wanting um, in Spark, we talked about sellers being A, B, or C sellers. They may remember that. What's an A seller? Okay. What's a B seller? Yep, 15 to 60 days. And a C seller? Which one's more important? All of them, actually. <laughs> you want to make sure you're doing the right things with all of them. But if you just focus on right now, then once you get these people under contract, you're like, oh, crap. I'm out of people again. Trying to get in. Let me look. Two people trying to get in. Yes. 
Our class is just growing by leaps and bounds. Okay, so before the appointment, one of the big things you need to try and do is figure out where they're at with it. Um, I've done listing appointments with people who are not going to be buying for a year because I want to get in touch. I want to build a relationship. Um, that's my thing is if I can build a bond with them, I feel like I have a, an edge over anybody else who could come in. So that's the big thing is you got to figure out where they're at with these things as you go. I got myself ahead of the pages. Okay, so let's go back. They talk about pre-qualifying a seller. What does that mean to anybody? Because that's kind of a new phrase to me, pre-qualifying a seller. I was thinking of it with a buyer, but what does it mean on a seller too? Anybody have any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. So he's, and, they're really low too. and their timeline and how fast you need to get going with it. And I think that's the important thing. You can, you can spend your life running ragged if you don't ask the right questions at the beginning of, you know, are you ready right now? Are you an A or a B or a C? Um, I still want to go meet with everybody, but it, it helps you know how to prepare. Um, and let's say you meet with somebody and you find out they are going to be a seller down the road. The first thing I would do is stick them in command and put them on a biweekly neighborhood nurture. You know their address, pick that at that neighborhood and like all of them around. And then every two weeks, they're going to get an email from you showing you what's going on in the neighborhood with your name and your face plastered all over it. Um, so use the command stuff as much as you can to stay in touch with people because it's automated. Um, it's a great way to where you don't have to re recreate all the time. Okay, so next the pre-listing goals so this is part of this conversation amy was talking about once you've pre-qualified the seller and you schedule a listing appointment you will send a pre-listing packet now this is this is a little bit different from how i do it but this is a great thing i think i'm going to start adding it in your pre-listing goals are to state your value let them know why what you bring to the table and what they should use you for pre-selling builds confidence in you and it answers questions one of the big things I've always heard is if somebody asks questions of you, you haven't done your job because you should provide that info before they even get to it. So you want to put together a pre-listing packet that will tell them everything you can about you or your company from the beginning. And it's going to save you time because it's going to answer a lot of your objections up front. Now, one of the biggest things when you're first starting out, you don't, if you don't have a lot of sales or a track record, if you make sure I say it right. If you can't brag on me, brag on we. You're part of the fastest growing company in the area. You're partnered with all kinds of top agents. We sold a billion in house sales, Springfield area last year. We sold 5,000 transactions, Springfield Market Center. So if you don't have the stats, brag on the company because you're part of it. And you know how we work as a team here. Um, it's amazing to me how many things get sold on our internal Facebook page before they even hit the market. Um, so if you can't brag on me, brag on we. And there's a lot of different things you can use to put that together, but you don't have to just be on yourself. And when I first started, that's how I did it. I'm like, I, you know, I'm brand new, but I'm partnered with all these people, so they're going to help me do it exactly like you. And here's another angle I use also. I don't have 40 or 50 clients. So I'm like, what was the movie? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm, you're mine. I will show you the money. <laughs> you know, I'm focused on just you, you know? Um, so there's, you always got to look at what positive you have. There is no good or bad. It's what's your positive and what you can provide for people. So put that together in how you're looking at explaining yourself. Now the pre-listing packet, number one, again, it's going to state your value. It's going to tell what you provide as a listing agent. And, and you know the sellers have specific goals they want to achieve, and this is your first step in discovering that and getting it from them. The pre-selling also builds their confidence and answers questions in advance of the presentation. And has anybody gotten a chance from the flyers here to look into the designs on this and look at some of the pre-listing info? Okay, it will lay it out for you basically, and then you can modern or um, individualize it for yourself. 
And the biggest time on the pre-listing is it saves you time by tackling common obstacles to make the consultation shorter and smoother. I hate going to somebody's house and being there for three hours, and I've done it before. The more things you can answer ahead of time, or if you get info to them and they have a list of questions already there, you can get right through them. But the more info you can provide ahead of time, the better off it is to save your time on the actual appointment. Okay, so one of the biggest questions anyone, let me read that again. Okay, what, uh, sorry, they worded this weird. What do you think some of the most common questions are people are gonna ask if you're trying to sell their house? How, how what? How much, how, much. how much can you get for me? What else? How long will it take? What's the bigger thing they ask all the time? Bigger, that's a good one, but what else is there? How much do I have to pay? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that one comes up a lot. So the more of this you can answer ahead of time, not necessarily say putting it in, in writing, but the more of these things that you can be prepared that they're going to ask, the better off you are once you get to that appointment with them. Um, <clears throat> what are other objections you might think you'd run into? How many people have been on a listing appointment? Been to somebody's house? Okay. What, what are the things you've run into so far? And it's interesting in this current market because I've had people ask that and they say, what do I need to fix? I say, right now, nothing. <laughs> you know, they're going to buy it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, you got to fix this. You got to conceal this crack. You got to, I mean, it was a list of stuff before you could e even get to that. So it changes as time goes. And the more you can be aware of what market we're in, the more you can answer that on. And you said you've been on some listing appointments? Yeah. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. And somebody over here, Jackie, could you? Okay. The one big thing on repairs that I'd suggest anything you see standing out that will it make us buy or go, if that's wrong, what else is wrong? That's the biggest thing. So if they see a small little crack somewhere, they go, foundation's gone. This house needs $20,000. So if there are things like that that just obviously stand out to you, and that's what I typically do, I, and we'll get into that here in a second. I walk through the house like I'm a buyer, you know, and I want to go through and, and just look at it with those eyes and think what will what will be objections. So that's that's a great thing on that. Any other things we think we run into? Uh -huh. And and that's a lot that you can have in your pre-listing and in your actual listing packet. And I did bring some sample of ours too that I can hand around here in a little bit. And this is all like 90% of this is downloaded from command. But we took this and then we stuck our pictures in. It has our little, it's, I call it about us. It's the story of Brown Town Homes of what we do. Um, our, our MVVBP, our mission, vision, values, beliefs, perspective, which you see that all over as part of what we believe in. I encourage you to do that on yourself. And Tim can teach a great class where you do it individually on how to tell what you're different. Why do you do real estate? You know, and that changes over time. But for example, my vision on here, our goal is to, is to use the business of real estate to bless the lives of our clients, our agents and staff, our cooperating agents and our community. Our values, are to, our goal is to work together and lift each other up, always be positive and pour into each other's lives as well as our clients' lives. There is nothing in all this really about all the, the dollars and the, all this other stuff, it's everything else that we do. So you, as you're in it more, you'll start going, this is why I do what I do. The, the most important ones are when you are at a closing with somebody and they've been through a life transition. And that's why I told people, say, what do you do? I'm a life transition specialist. <laughs> because selling or buying a house is a life transition. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes you're dealing with a divorce where they're selling a house or a, a death in a family you're taking a giant piece of this huge weight off their shoulders because it's not just about the house. It's about all these other things. The one that hit me the most, um, it's, <laughs> this is against Keller Williams principles, but I showed somebody 172 houses. Yeah, because we'd find one, we'd write an offer, 
something would happen. And this was uh, several years ago too. But come to find out, it was uh, some friends of mine. I had no, actually he was one of my high school teachers, but he'd moved to Springfield and, or they were getting ready to move to Springfield. They didn't even live here yet, but they'd also just gotten married. It was a, a later in life marriage and they had just um, lost a baby. And it wasn't about a house. It was about all these different things in life and going to a new city and all this. And so once I took a step back, I'm like, okay, yeah, it was a lot of houses. But we helped them through a big part of life. And they used me again until they became realtors. <laughs> <laughs> and so now every time he has to show a lot of houses, I go, yeah, that's <laughs> payback to you. So is, if you look at real estate as buying and selling houses, yeah, it's okay, but that's going to burn you out. When you see the bigger picture of what you're doing can change people's lives and your own. I mean, Kane and I, are there other people in here from the education world? There are online too. But we would work our butts off and you get the same amount of raise as the guy in the next room, whether they did anything or not. And here, the more you help people, the more it blesses you, the more it blesses your family. And it, it's a legacy. So um, it's, it's a cool way of life and I'm glad you all are in it and, and Though getting started is sometimes slow, things are slow, then they're fast. Then it's slow, then fast. Just, just realize this is all part of the process. And I'm way off the topic here. So <laughs> that's why I have the papers in front of me. We do that to our teachers. Yeah. <laughs> so the pre-listing packet, it says we're supposed to divide participants into pairs. I'm not sure if we're going to do this. We're supposed to read over the pre-listing packet in the toolkit, then ask one of you to answer questions about the pre-listing packet. So who has the toolkit in front of you? Let's just have a couple of people read different parts. I think it's something that uh, Nicole emailed to you. I think it's these the documents. There's not? I don't know. It's supposed to have an actual packet. So that, Okay. But it basically just has the questions, right? It just has the questions. Okay. Let's go through the questions and we'll sort of figure that out as we go. So, Amy, what was the first question you saw? What are re okay. What are some reasons people overestimate the value? Yes. Well, a lot more to them than somebody else. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how many times I've heard, I put this $5,000 shed in. Well, that's nice. <laughs> what I tell people on those kind of things, or, the, you know, I just spent $8,000 on an HVAC. Well, that's good. It will help it sell better, but every house is assumed to have an HVAC. You know, it's like, I, I, I got wheels on my car. You know, new wheels, yes, they add a little value, but the car's expected to have wheels. Katie, what's the next question? What? That'd be helpful if we had the pre-listing packet, wouldn't it? Okay, check that real quick. And part of it is Ignite has changed drastically and COVID changed even more. So I just bring, are you waving or is it flies? Flying. Okay. <laughs> well, our custodian was sick with COVID for a little while. So, it, so that's why it was a, is it? Okay. Okay. Well, then it's not our custodian's fault. It's yeah, that's it. Or we're getting it's which play which plague are we in now? <laughs> we'll just figure out where we're going. Yes, I like that. Okay. I will I want to make a note. We will find the pre-listing packet. It may have been. Yeah. I know. So, 
So basically though, this, I actually use this as our listing packet also, but you can use it either way. But basically it's something to get to the people ahead of time to introduce yourself, tell things about you, um, you know, sell yourself ahead of time so they know what to expect when you come in. Well, I don't yet. Um, this is more about you, not about their house. So typically what, what we typically do in our office, there's a whole stack of buyer packs right here ready to go. And it's just, this is info on us. It's not about the house they want to see. There's also a stack of seller packs ready to go. Um, and so, you know, it's taken me years to get where I went. I tweaked things. I just saw a, a change we're going to make also because one, one wrong page is in there. But that way, if somebody calls and says, I, I've just gotten in town, I've got to list something quickly, you've got that packet ready. All you got to do is grab the info on their house and put it together. Basically, you're pre-selling yourself and showing it's your promotion packet. The, the best way I thought of looking at this, if you go over to Thompson and you they have these brochures on each different type of car, don't they? And it talks about the Cadillac Escalade and how it does this and how the, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't show you a price. It doesn't show you anything, but it's a packet to sell you on that. It's the feel of it. You know, that's what your pre-listing packet is doing. Yes, ma'am. But I've seen it there, but I'm going to find out. Okay. I've not seen one in there, but let's double check that. Let me check one thing here. But so the pre-listing packet to me is about yourself for the most part. Then, oh, so we'll jump screens. So then you get to the listing presentation. Um, actually, back it up to before the appointment. You get the appointment, and the, the once you've got it. This is not in the scripts anywhere. This is my personal opinion. Shut up. <laughs> Don't say anything else. It's like you just got the date with the prom king or the prom queen. Shut up. Don't say anything that's going to make them cancel the date. <laughs> you know, so that's the, the weirdest way to look at it, I know. But you get the appointment with them. So you got an appointment. Then it's suggesting you know where the house is. Run by the pre-listing appointment. Like, so if I'm going to meet with somebody Saturday at 10, tomorrow I bring my pre-listing packet. I drop it at their front door, or I might ring the bell, see if they're there, but I give them something ahead of time or even email it. I mean, make these into a PDF. And so if I have somebody that calls me and says, hey, we're interested, great, here's my stuff and I can PDF it. That's not as personal, but especially if they're like out of town just coming in. But you want to have something set and ready to go to where you can just automatically be able to send it without thinking about things or copying this page from here, that page from here. And then we'll talk about some of the actual listing presentations that are in command. Okay, jumping ahead some. The listing appointment. The purpose of the listing presentation is to get the seller to list with you. That's why you're going, okay? That's the main thing. You're going to get the signature or at least get them to where they're pretty sure it's you you're going with. You achieve that by doing these three things. You create a great impression to build the seller's confidence and use their real estate agent of choice. Also, you share your price recommendation. I'm a little cautious on this if I've never been at the house. So I do that a little differently because I always look at it as if I go to the doctor and he tells me what I need before he's examined me, I don't trust that doctor. So I, I do a little bit different there. I'm going to go through their house and figure out what I'm seeing, then try to come up with a price. But I might have at least a price range. So what I typically do is like if I'm going to Carriage Park, I know there's a house there. I will run everything that's sold. I, I'll run a, basically the one-page CMA on Carriage Park. So I can tell them, here's what's sold in your neighborhood. Now that I've looked at your house, my homework is to go back and find out what are the best comparables for you. But that at least gives them some info, shows you've done homework ahead of time. It's put that all together. Okay, and the third thing, it should set expectations for how you will market the home and work with the sellers. Just like the pre-listing packet, you don't have to figure this out for yourself. There are two beautifully designed templates in designs in command. So I'm going to see if I can jump off this screen and show you how to find them. Hey, that's me at Disney. Yay. Okay, Zoom people, this may not work. So I apologize if we lose you for a second. Okay, except on Zoom, I know you can't see it as well right now. Okay, so under designs, 
go in here and this might look a little different because I downloaded this a while ago, but on designs, you'll see all types. There's email, social print video. I've got it on all right now. If I go to print, I think it would bring it up also, but I'm going to leave this up. So right here is our listing presentation we created. But you see, I have 34 things down here. You should be able to go in and download a template. And there's what there used to be one called modern and contemporary. I'm, I'm trying to find where those are. Okay, see, it says buyer presentation classic, buyer presentation modern. Listing template classic, page, listing template modern. So you should be able to download either of these. These may have been some that came out of bold, and I don't know if these are showing up on yours, but you should be able to search through the designs catalog and pull these down. And I'm guessing, like I think Cassie said, or no, Jackie, that might be where the pre-listing packet is too. I just found. Okay. Okay, so here's something else I'm going to suggest to everybody. Here's my toolbar across here. I just, I just tag the Google Drive. Because what Nicole is starting to do is every document you're going to need, she's putting in the Keller Williams Greater Springfield Google Drive so it's shareable all the time. But I always have trouble remembering how exactly to get to it. And then right here is mine. So that's where you found it, Amy. That up. Checklist for oops. But it is on the drive. So it is. this. Look at the presentation. Those of you online, sorry, it's the backward screen. But I would bookmark the drive mm -hmm. because especially that one, she's putting everything into there. Guide to selling your home. This is five factors affecting the value of your property. It's a 14 page item. If I did, I'd do it as a PDF. I don't know that I'd send, because it's still not about their house at all. This is about market expectations. I love especially this. Okay, so what if I want to price it $5,000 higher? Well, how much difference does that make? Well, it could be six months. You know, there's all these different things they need to think about. And this is very true. So there's another stat we use all, all the time. If a house got eight showings and no offers, it was at least 10% too high. If you're getting no showings, 20% too high. So there's all these different stats, but the more of this you can give to them ahead of time. And Amy, thank you for finding that. That's It's in the Google Drive shared ready to sell condition. So here's your questions about repairs. So all these things we've been talking about, and even gives the questions. What is the most important thing you're looking for in your listing agent? Maybe, they, maybe you're doing a farm. They want somebody that knows farm and land property. Well, then that's not me. I'll get somebody else for you. Um, what prior real estate transaction experiences have you had? My company sold a, a billion dollars last year, and I'm part of that. Okay? How would you like to be communicated with? This is golden because if somebody, like, like you young whippersnappers that don't like to call people, you like to text, it's important to learn how to communicate with people because they will ignore you otherwise. Um, we're dealing with somebody right now who does not do any of it. It's all in person. So, but we need, it's important to know that from the beginning. How frequently would you like an update on showings? All these things help you know what their expectations are. Oh, my screen. Hi, Sabrina. Okay, so this is there under the pre-listing packet or under the, under the Google Drive. So all the documents are there, and I believe it's editable where you can add things 
If, even if it isn't, you can make your own things to add into it as well. Okay, jumping back. And then hopefully this goes back the way it was. Go there. there. Ending at Epcot. Nope. Hey, Tyler. Okay, I just got Sabrina in. Let's see. If, is that who it was? Okay, I think we got everybody else too. We just don't have a screen going, so other than that, we're fine. Thanks. Change this totally. My computer's old also, and it's about to die, so it doesn't like doing that. Okay, the listing presentation. So that's the other thing we were just looking at. Um, it looks like Nicole's got it posted in there. There are also some, as you take different classes, that you can download into command also. Or find anybody. If you saw, like, my modern one or the contemporary, I think I can share those with anybody that wants to use them too. But the listing presentation, this is where you're going to be going in and working through um, looking at the house and figuring out what you're going to do with it for them. It wants us to divide into groups of three or four and go to page 11 of our participant guide. I think we're going to go ahead and skip over that. Here are some things that are important on it, though. It shows this is one of the pages that comes up in the listing presentation. And it's about their needs coming first. Again, this is more about them than us. And the more we can do that and focus on their side of things, that's it's building the relationship with them. Okay, at this point, we're supposed to divide into pairs and pres present the listing presentation to each other. I think, do we want to do that, or do you want to do that on your own sometime? I think they've been doing most of it at the end of the class this year, haven't they, with Ignite? Ignite used to be like a four-hour class, and you do things, then you go apart, then you come back together. I was liable for three. Really? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have that this week. It's been great. Okay, who did it? Well, we had, well, we do. Really? Yes. And then. Oh, yeah, that is this quick. Oh, my gosh. He yeah. sells, every open house he does, he gets a, a lead out of it. Yeah. So. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we're, we're, we're now in charge. <laughs> okay. And, and as I look through the, the info from what they did here, I do things a couple, a little bit different, but I'm going to tell you the good and the bad of both. Okay. So the recommendation is you go to the house. Let me get my notebook. I'll put the misses in. Knock, knock. Hi, Mr. Seller. How are you? Okay. <laughs> you, any of you can do a voice. This is an awesome house. I love this neighborhood. Do you mind if I come on in and take a look? Sometimes I'll check if they want shoes on, off, masks on, off. I'm in their home. I want to present and do the way they want to. So I'm whatever. The way I was always told, you never say the word no unless the word problem is followed right after it. No problem. 
I'll do whatever you want me to. So the KWA suggests you ask if you can put your things down in the kitchen and then go take a look around the house. The reason for that, the kitchen table is a pretty comfortable spot to sit through and talk with things. If you end up in the living room, it's formal. They're sitting on a couch, you're over here on a chair. If you can get to the table with people, that's the best thing. So the suggestion is drop your bag there and go ahead and take a look, ask them if, they can, if you can take a look through the house. I prefer to have them take me on a tour of the house because then while I'm writing, they're telling me everything they love about it because it's about what they see and what they want. So, okay, so we're here in your living room and I'm sorry, those of you online, see if I can do this too. You won't see me for part of it. Okay, and I'm taking meticulous notes constantly. Hardwood floors, fan, uh, popcorn ceiling, good, bad, in my terrible handwriting, and then I gotta go home and translate it because no one can read it. But every room I go into, uh, BR1, that's my shortcut for it. Uh, bedroom one has carpet, it has crown molding, there's a trade ceiling, uh, large walk-in closet. I'm getting every note I can because I'm gonna go back and write up my marketing notes already and every detail I have about the house. Part of the reason I started doing it that way, when I worked with Fonley Harley, um, we had a person, there were four of us, me and Fonley were the two main buying and selling agents. Then we had a closing person at the office and a listing person. The listing person was going to put everything into flex for us. They're never going to the house. They're never going to see it. So I was their eyes and ears. So the more I could put down, they could do that. And, or if I'm doing it now on myself late at night, I don't remember a house after I've gone through it, but my notes will. So I'm going living room, LR, um, you know, whatever on it. Uh, that TV, is it's got a mount on it. Is that staying? Uh, because the rule is basically people assume the mount is staying, the TV isn't. Are you going to look at leaving the TV? Okay. All these notes I'm doing because it's also showing my knowledge of how the, the housing market works. Kitchen, okay. Kitchen, great tile floors. Oh, what kind of, is that laminate or granite you've got there? Obviously, we would know. That's another thing on my marketing. I, I look at marketing as a dating website, okay? I'm gonna put on pictures and stuff that's appealing. I'm not going to point out moles. <laughs> you know, my sister had moles all over her face, that kind of thing. So is laminate countertops, are those appealing ever to somebody? Do you have to put that it's a laminate countertop on that checkbox? So if there's things that I know are not going to be appealing, my goal is get them to the house so they will fall in love with the house and go, ah, I don't mind the moles. I like the rest of the personality, that kind of idea. So I'm making notes so I know, but I'm not necessarily putting everything into flex. Okay, uh, stainless appliances, yes, I always check the inside of the dishwasher. If it's stainless on the interior, it's gonna be very quiet also, just a side note on that. Um, the fridge, are you leaving it? Okay, it might be negotiable. Okay, we'll just put that down too. All these things I wanna have on my notes and I'm putting it by kitchen, bedroom one, bedroom two, what's the exterior material? While we're going along, how old is this, uh, Mr. Seller? How old is your roof? Do you know when you last repaired it? Um, I wanna look at the HVAC. I wanna see if it's high efficiency. How do you find out if a furnace is high efficiency? Anybody know the easy way? If it's there, yeah, there's usually a sticker. High efficiency is 90 or higher, okay? But what's the easy way to know? High efficiencies are so efficient that they don't need a metal flue coming out of them. It's plastic. So if you see a PVC pipe, I've never seen one that isn't, that's probably a high efficiency furnace. So I'm even looking in that, number one, so I can check and just so they realize, hey, this guy knows some stuff about houses already. So I'm gonna try and check the furnace. I'm gonna check the water heater, see if it's gas. By the way, they're not hot water heaters. If it was hot, you would need to heat it anyway. <laughs> But, so how do you tell if it's gas or electric? Look what's running to it. Is there a gas line with a little yellow knob or is it just one electric? Why does that matter? It doesn't, except when you go back and you're putting stuff in flex later on. It saves you sitting there in front of them later on to do it all. So I'm doing all the notes I can on the house and we are way off where this is supposed to go, but hopefully this <laughs> helps with it all. Um, I'm walking to the backyard. I'm going through every room, looking for every detail that I know has to be put into flex. Uh, the back patio, is it screened? Is it count, can we count it as square footage? It might be unfinished, it might not. Um, what about any easements? Also, while I'm going, I'm asking them, um, you know, what is your favorite part about this house? In fact, we have a page called My Favorite Things, and they fill that out. 
and it tells their five or six things they love about the house. Guess what they just did? My marketing remarks. I take that and work it into the marketing, you know, because they may tell me something that I wouldn't have noticed. Like, what do you love about your house? Well, when I sit on the front porch at sunset, the sun goes down right here, and this is just a gorgeous, tranquil spot. I would have known that going through at noon. So the more they can tell me about why they love the house, I'm appealing to what they love about it, and that's what the next buyer is going to love. Okay, so I'm walking through my house. Then I get all my notes, come back to the table with them, and that's where we try and sit down with all decision makers. <laughs> Don't you love that when you go somewhere like Timeshare or whatever, and they're like, are all decision makers here? No, we're not signing anything anyway. So, uh, so basically, I, and like I said, let me see where we're at on this. We'll get the seller objections. And when are we supposed to be done? I'm all. Okay, do we? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, and, and anyone from Keller Williams listening, this is not on script, so it's not normal. <laughs> Make sure nobody else is in the waiting room. I'm going to throw my chat up real quick so I can see if anybody needs this. No chats. So I've gotten all my notes. I'm trying to think of anything else real quick on my notes I do. Um, I check the garage. I look for if it's an insulated door. Um, if it is, if it isn't, you just see the metal and you can hear it. It's pretty echoey. Um, basements. I want to, if there's a basement, I want to see, you know, what I can down there, how much is finished, how much is unfinished. If it's a crawl space, I'm asking if they have a vapor barrier um, because I don't want to crawl under there. They may or may not know. If they have one, they probably know because it probably costs $2,000 to put the thing in. Actual vapor barriers that work are $8,000. So that's why there's such a big discrepancy on whether there should be a vapor barrier or not. But the proper way to do one is you, you run a drain and a sump pump, then you run the plastic and you tape it at every seam and at every post and up the sidewalls this far. And then you seal all the crawl space vents, except for one with a humidification fan. And then you put a sump pump, a humidification fan, and an evaporator down there. Very few people are ever gonna do that. <laughs> so that's, that's why sometimes people say a vapor barrier does nothing. And if you do that, all the water stays underneath the vapor barrier. And I'm off on a whole other tangent. Anyway, so I wanna know all that stuff. Does it have a vapor barrier? What's the age of the roof? Is there flooring in the attic? If there's one board, that's partially floored. It, there's no percentage. So if they put one piece of plywood up in their attic, that's a partially floored attic. Um, what other things can you all think of that might be a question on the actual details of the house? Um, I'm not measuring it at that point, and I do measure every room. Um, I tend to do that, yeah. Well, if you're not in the well is it a septic do you know where the septic is yeah is it easy to find it because if it's not and they got to pay to dig it up that's 150 dollars um, we had one at table rock they they'd never known where it was for 25 years and we found it because it was a vacation home so they never used the septic much so they never had to pump it it was like 20 feet down <laughs> before they could find the thing so the more of this info you can have ahead of time saves you a headache down the road Okay, so we've gotten all our info. That's for me to use later when I go back and fill it all out as if someone is not going in the house, but I got to let them know everything about it. Okay, so then I get there, there to the home with them. And the first thing I do is I have, I have an, uh, this packet and a info on the house. I'm going to talk through what any, first off, I'm going to ask them, what questions do you have? What concerns do you have? What's your time frame? Because I want to know what ways to help them because there's, 20 pages in here. I'm not going through all this. I'm hitting the specific spots they need. Okay. So if they say this is, you know, we, we've got to be in our next town by, by the beginning of school year, we got to price quickly. Um, you know, here's what we're doing. Great. Now I know how to approach things with them. So I'm going to talk them through, and this is our own individual page. Like, like I said, most of these you can find in, in um, design in command but I have a five step thing about how we're gonna treat them, how we're gonna take care of them. I also have, and these are up here and I can send emails of this to anybody. Find the right page that I'm looking for.
five simple steps. This is my simple step process to help them get through the listing. Market analysis and price, that's what I'm doing right now. Then we're going to list the home and we're going to tell them all the things we're going to do as the listing. Follow up after being listed. A lot of people think a realtor sticks it in the internet and they're done. And realtors are terrible for not making people realize the value they're giving. So I'm going to tell them, we're going to provide a listing binder. I do a binder in every house. It has a design or a flyer we make in command because command will auto load stuff from flex. You just hit the recycle button and it puts the picture in. It puts the auto words. You don't have to recreate everything. So it has that on the front. It has the disclosures in there. It has the neighborhood amenities. Um, it ha and it has extra copies of disclosures in the fold for people to take them because a lot of agents will never, a lot of agents don't know how to get disclosures for them. So I make it as easy as possible also so they go, huh, my buyer's agent's not doing real good for me. <laughs> so it also has all the info on it and it has my favorite things. That's the first page in here. So it's them telling the new buyer what they love about the house, but there's going to be a, a packet and we've got these upstairs I could show you sometime. Um, follow up after being listed, we'll use showing suite. Showing suite is free software you have that will do the feedbacks. Do you all ever get those when you show a house? It, it comes in and says, what do you like about the house? What's this? What's that? That can go straight to the seller. And that way I'm not having to relay the message each time. Also in flex, when you set up a listing, you can make it email them every week, telling them how many people looked at the house online. And we have a thing called List Hub, which is free for you, listhub.com. 15th and 30th of the month, it will send your sellers a report. The worst thing we ever do is we don't give them enough information because they're sitting there every day going, why is my house not sold? The more you can give it to them, the better off you are there. We will monitor web activity, provide how many hits you, your listing has had. We'll do a new CMA at the end of each month to see if we're still priced right. That used to be a thing. Houses didn't sell in four days. And so we'll get back to that at some point. In fact, we're already doing a couple houses that have price changes, but I'm going to stay in touch with them throughout because they're sitting there going, Oh my gosh, you know, what happens after I'm listed? So I'm going through this with them about what we're going to do first. Are you adjusting that for like no, what, I, what I do is I tell them, well, if we get to a market like this, but hopefully we have your house sold by then. Oh. So I just, I sort of paraphrase it that way. Okay. Then I have, I printed off their old listing. And if there is one with photos, that's fun. Cause if somebody has been in the house 13 years and they still have Royal green carpet from those pictures, they get to look at that and they're like, Oh my gosh, can you remember? And there was wallpaper here. So I do the, the, uh, the private printout because we'll have all the details. It'll show when it was closed, who the other agent was and the photos. I have that for them. I have the CRS tax report. And if it's in Greene County, I do the Greene County tax report. And the reason I do that, I'm saying, okay, when you bought the house, it said it was 2,217 square feet. Sometimes tax records are different. You know, if they are, I just want to find out why. And if it's lower on tax records, I tell them that's great. That means you're paying less tax. But typically they're all the same, especially in Greene County. Christian County, if you pull up CRS, square footage includes a garage. So you'll see people that list a house 400 square foot too big because they didn't know to take that out of there. So just, there's a lot of things with oh, Stone County. They won't put square footage on it because they, uh, there's every county was different and it's slowly being morphed together. And a lot of the data hasn't transferred yet. Um, but also it'll show you what's called base square footage. Typically that's first floor. So if you got a two story house or a basement house, Somewhere on the tax record, it'll say base square footage, not all three different things. So, okay, so I've got all three of those things for them. I say, this is the way your house looked before. You know, isn't it fun how different it is now? They're like, holy cow, we didn't even have that third room added on or whatever. Then I've got a printout of the subdivision. I do a one-line CMA that shows what's active, what's pending, and what's closed in the last year. That way I can, this is because I have not seen their house yet. I'm saying to them, this is what's going on in your neighborhood, and this is what an appraiser has to look at. I'm setting everything up for an expectation down the road of what we're going to be dealing with. Questions online? No. Okay. So, so I go through that and say, now here's three or four that are about the same size of yours, but now that I've looked at yours, I can do some exact homework and come up with a full CMA for you. 
And that's where my CMA class, where I go through the full CMA and you can set your name, your picture, how to do all that. But I do, I do not have that with me. I have a range for them. I say, it looks like your house is between, actually go way back. Here's the most important question to ask. I admit Jordan Rhodes into the room. Have you, do you have a price you're thinking of? That's the most important one. Cause if they're, I, I keep going back to two weeks ago, if we would have asked that on this home, instead of just going in and assuming we had the listing, we could have answered a little bit better. So sometimes they won't tell you, they'll say, well, that's your job to tell me what it's worth. But if they will tell you what they're thinking, that at least gives you an idea. You know, it's not gonna change what I tell them really, it's gonna change how I tell them. You know, if they're asking for a house that's 289 and you realize it should actually be 300, um, you could, at least you know, and you can come in and say, I know this is what you want. I think we could try 300. Because the minute I'm talking to somebody, this is, this is a, a market a year ago, I'm already working on a price change. Because if it doesn't sell in 14 days or a month, I'm wanting to do a price reduction. I want that in their head already. So I'm usually saying, this is where the appraisal value should be in this market. And actually right now what we started doing, because I've, I've lost three in the past year because I told them what the appraisal value should be. They listed with somebody else about 20% higher and it's sold. So I'm telling them, this is where the appraisal value is, but I'm recommending we add 20% right now. now. I think that's changing pretty quick, but I'm that way I'm at least setting them up and saying, there's no way it should sell for this, but it may. So let's try it. I would always rather have the listing and reduce it later than not have the listing. That's my mindset. Because when you have a listing, guess what? Buyers call on it. Then you take those buyers and you go sell them something else. The getting the listing is a great lead generation source. Um, if you have a listing, you can run a Facebook ad. You can run a Facebook ad on any of my listings. I don't care because that's putting it out, but it's also getting you leads into command. Have any of you ever looked at that much? Okay, Kirk, do you have two? Or question? So those of you online, Kirk said he ran a Facebook ad. How much did you spend on it? Eighty-five dollars. He got eight leads out of it. So the Facebook ads are an affordable way to do things. Off, it's back to my main point: listings. A listing will do everything for you. It's actually sad they're selling so fast because that's where your leads come from. So if they'll start hanging on the market two weeks, you'd be amazed how many more buyers you can get through it. Now of those eight listings, how many do you think will actually convert and become clients? Right. And you know what they're looking for because it was a certain house they looked at. So now you can set a smart plan on that neighborhood or that area where it's gonna send stuff to them. The, the whole world of real estate is staying in touch for the long term. So yes, we got to have sales right now, but the more you can stay in touch with value down the road, like I had a lady text me earlier today, somebody I've been working with for three years. She hasn't bought anything yet, but her price range is 1.2 million. So I will keep looking and showing her houses because at some point, and number one, it's fun to go to $1.2 million houses, you know, Lakeview, I'm like, oh my, look at this, you know, awesome view. Okay, so that's the second part of my thing. I am, I've got info on me and my team, and then on the house. So it's, it's sort of a twofold thing. I have, usually I have one of the bind or the folders you can get up front and one side has not these, the, the thin paper ones. One, because I want to leave stuff with them. I love digital, but there's something about leaving paper in somebody's hands in their house because it's there every time they walk by it. And, and you know, digital, the great thing or the bad thing about it is you can delete it. You can get rid of it. You, you quit looking at it. It gets buried in 500 emails. If you leave something in their house, they're more likely to call you back. So back to that again, the listing presentation. Okay, we're, <laughs> we're spending a lot of time on this, which is good. Um, so I go through all the details on them and I say, okay, so here's where I see on your house, this is what we're gonna do to market it. But I've gotta go find a price first. If we price too high, we will not get any uh, list or any activity and we'll know pretty quick. 
because we can monitor all that. Sorry for changing the screen share again. Okay, this is the strangest spot to find it. I'm gonna go to my listings. For those of you online, I'm jumping from this, the PowerPoint to some other stuff, which you probably figured out. Okay, here's a new listing we just did, Madison Street. Okay, this is a great stat. See, change, it's weird to get here. You gotta to go to change listing. I don't know why it's there. Go to Madison and under change listing, this is where you change all the details, the list price, all that, the, the word activity. This house we listed Tuesday. This will show you how much flex activity it's had. 201 from normal flex, 110 times it's been emailed, 37 times it's been seen in a portal, 25 times it was shared through IDX. So this house since Tuesday has been seen 200, 300, almost 400 times. Not been recommended by agents any, it's been saved three times, hidden by one person. It also shows other things they're viewing, so you know what you're competing against. That's, that's not, that you can get through the Supra and the showing suite side, but this thing, look at this, auto emails. You can set this to email to the client. So once a week, they're getting an email seeing how much activity is going. So this house, by the way, is getting an open house this Sunday if anybody needs it. But <laughs> talk to Kelly Hunt and Kelly Nystrom. They're the ones coordinating that. Um, and they may have already found somebody. But if this house has five to almost 500 viewings and no offers, what's that tell you? We're too high. And we, he knew it going in. We told him, we said, based on this market, if you've got time, let's try this price for seven days. But this, this is my proof right here. So all this, under, and I know it's weird, it's under change listing and then activity. But I can go in here and I can set this up to email to him. I first got to pick his name out of my contacts. Frequency, I can tell it to go once a week, once a month, what day of the week, and this will go automatically. So this is part of our listing checklist to put this in on people. There's also the thing called List Hub. Way off subject, but that's okay. Log in. And this is free. It should have been in your Scott Leroy email. I love this because, again, it sets up everything for you. If I buy a faster computer, it would go quicker. So it takes about six hours and then it will automatically load these in from Flex. Once they're in here, you can set up reports to go to them. Oh, and I forgot, I'm logged in as, as Keller Williams, not as Mike. Try that again. <laughs> I'm like, that's not my listing. Okay, so I know, <laughs> I was like, what's going on? So here's what this sends what, every, the 15th and 30th of each month. It shows, so this is another thing that will show your property received 2,700 views. It shows when it was active. And all this you can set to automatically email to your people too. So the minute, and you notice it's got our name, our branding. Get used to just putting your stuff in everything. Almost every website we've got has somewhere for your profile. Brand yourself over and over. Put, you know, get professional pictures. I think we had a pro guy doing headshots yesterday. Um, but, you know, and I got a guy, another band director, <laughs> but he'll do it for like a hundred bucks and he'll give you like 10 or 15 of them. You know, David Nace, he did, he did my photos. Actually, he did these that we have um, also. But the more of this you can put out, number one, it shows them you're working for them and it's helping you do a price reduction if the time comes. And that market's coming soon. But um, again, all this stuff goes out automatically to people. So back to our PowerPoint. <laughs> I know we're going long. So by the end of the listing presentation, my goal is to walk away with them signed. So I have a notebook where I've taken my notes. I've got the listing forms already filled out. The listing agreement, I don't have flex yet, but I have my listing agreement and I have a whole checklist. I am ADD, I will forget things. So I've got a whole checklist. You know what? Let's go to the checklist, which I can share with everybody too. Listing checklist, look at that. 
And on, I use Word. I don't like Google stuff. To me, it's not as good as the, the Microsoft stuff, which is weird to say. But on Word, if you right click here, you can pin things you use over and over. So they're automatically right here. But here's my, whoops, here's my listing checklist. So blue items go in my listing binder for the office. I have a binder in the office on each listing, so we have fast info for it. MLS data flex sheet, not yet. And notice the two asterisks. Disclosures, that's one we always need. Here are all the others you might need. You always need the measurement disclaimer. The two asterisks are things required for compliance. So anything I know I'm going to need, I'm going to try and take it already filled out. If it has a pool or hot tub, these are all the different disclosures you might need. Broker disclosure form. I might as well have them initial that while I'm here. The more of this stuff I can get done now, it means another client, another agent's not coming to see them, and I can already get ahead of things. Agency listing contract. This is where you need to walk through the whole process, and I think Don has a class on this on the listing contract, and he explains it really well on how to walk through any objections on that. Like one of the big ones on there is um, – it says additional, no, I'm sorry, I'm on the buyer one. Uh, it'll talk about the, you know, what you're paying and then your dual agency and all those things. That can get very confusing and you can get bogged down trying to explain transaction brokerage to somebody. So you don't want to get too deep on some of that stuff because it's complicated and how, I've never been transaction broker ever. And I've been dual, I don't mind dual agency. I do it because I figure I know a better inspector. I'm going to take care of both sides but I just got to make sure to explain it up front to people. So they don't think, well, it's like, he's going to, you know, just ramrod things through. Okay. Other things I do immediately. I already have the affiliated referral of business disclosure because it's compliance. I already have my home warranty acceptance waiver. I talk about that right then with them. I prefer to do the warranty every listing because it doesn't cost them anything till they close and it covers them during the listing period. We once had, it was a house on Delaware over here behind Hula Hands or in that area. Inspection came back, two bad heat exchangers. They had the warranty on it and put two furnaces in for them. So this covers them even during the listing period. That's why I always try and do it unless like they've got a brand new HVAC or something like that. But also let's say it gets negotiated out. You can keep the warranty on till the day before closing to protect them, cancel it, they never pay for it. So there's a, a lot of good to the using the home warranty and the home warranty company doesn't mind you doing that because they make their money the second year. They, they do not make money selling a warranty for $500. They make it by the next year, putting you on convenient payments for $80 a month. So they want clients and they understand that this is part of the, the listing process on that. Client info sheet. This is a sheet I have with their name, their info, all the stuff I need, their birthday, um, all that. Why? So I can put them in command on smart plans. I've got it from the beginning. I also do a utility info form. The more of that you can put on the listing and in your notebook you keep in the house, the more you're, you're answering questions for buyers. And I do a loan payoff info form because then I've already got the form for the title company giving them permission to get the payoff. I've got a ballpark amount on how much they owe so I can do an estimated net sheet for them when an offer comes in. So a lot of this I'm doing right now so that I can be ahead of the game with them later on. Association information, I usually leave this with them. I leave them my favorite things. I have a reminder of myself to get a key because nothing worse than not getting a key to a house. Any additional info I need to know. Then this is stuff in-house. Then once we come back to the office, so everything here that I can, I'm going to get signed or leave with them to work on. So like the association form, the loan form, I usually make two copies, one for my folder and one in case I need to leave it for them in case they got to get the info. Then page two of this is everything I got to do once I get back. Once I make it live, I know my MLS number. I know my lockbox number. I know how my, where my directionals are so I can go find them later because those are expensive after a while. Who loaded the MLS? Who loaded the pictures? Just so we don't miss anything. It's all about doing the... Real estate is very boring, actually. It's the same processes over and over. Here's the things I got to turn in for compliance. Here's my in-house binder. Did I get the home warranty? Did I email it to them? Did I set them up on showing suite? Did I do list hub? Did I do a property profile? I automatically get title work started. Local companies will do preliminary for free. That way, suddenly you realize, oh, there's a there's a, an ex-spouse still on this house. We got to get taken care of. Or it's in a trust. We actually need the trust power papers. 
So all this that I can do ahead of time makes the transaction smooth later on. The smoother the transaction, the more they're gonna use you next time down the road. What I do there, um, and I, Choice is who I use a lot for this. I will email Karen Markle over there, who's, that's her email. And I'll just say, Karen, can we get preliminary title work on this? So just the word preliminary, they get the basic. They're not going to work on everything else. They're just pulling the current record. They will also pull the current um, HOAs for you. So if you need that, you know, to find out. And uh, the great thing is attach those to your listings too. Okay, another rabbit we've chased, back to here. That's mine. Yeah, it's one I created. I'm happy to share it with anybody. So I'll try and just email it out to everybody. Um, and almost every agent here has a different version. Here's what I tell you on mine, take it, take my name off. It's now yours. Create it, change it, do what you want with it. I don't care what of my stuff you use or adjust for however you need it. So, because we're, we're all working together. I mean, there's an abundance. And if Keller Williams can sell everything, more power to us. Okay, so much for my speech on that too. So presenting the listing presentation. So I, when I'm sitting there with them, I am usually not giving them a price yet unless it's something I've already known. Then I'll say, here's, here's the price range we're at. If you wanna go aggressive, you know, we can try higher if you got time. If you need to sell faster, here's our lower range. But so typically I've gone in and I used to do this. If I, let's say I knew a house was, should be 200, but they might want 180 and 220. I have all three of those set up in my briefcase. And you pull out the one <laughs> that's what they're wanting. Um, as, you know, it's not, I'm not gonna go 500 on something like that. But, uh, but if you have separate things there and you can pull out exactly what they were thinking, it looks like, holy cow, this guy's thinking the same way we are. But my goal is to get the listing. I will list something high. I know that's not always the ideal thing, but I'd rather have a listing that's high than not have a listing because from the listing come more buyers and open houses and, and your name's in the yard and people see. It. And so someone went in. Nope, we're good there. It's probably saying I'm running out of time. Oh my gosh, we're so far off on this. So, <laughs> so here's next is talking about us going through the, the walk the walkthrough, I think I missed that. The home walkthrough, yeah, we did that. They suggest you do it on your own. I do sometimes, but I would rather somebody show me. Now, the thing is, when they show you, here's what happens. Okay, well, well, this is my hall closet, and it, it has a rack in here for, for coats. And then, and then this, we painted this wall in 2017, and I go through everything, so you just smile. But I, I kind of like them showing me around because they will, they'll pull up stuff that I didn't notice. And I'm just frankly taking notes actually anymore. Kelly takes notes because one of the Kellys is with me because my handwriting's so bad. But we want them to show it. So the walkthrough to me is a chance for them to, to let you feel what they've got on their house. The big thing is get the appointment and get there. Once you've got that listing, going back several steps on this, don't, don't do anything to lose the appointment, okay? Now let's go on the other side. You're here with them. And they're talking through and they say, I love what you're saying. I want to list with you, but I've actually got another appointment with an agent tomorrow. Okay. What would you, how would you handle that? That's a great point there. That's the one way to look at it. You say, okay, if you're wanting to look at somebody else, I must not have answered everything. What else, is there something I missed or something that's important to you? always turn it to you. It's not about, you know, they did something wrong. Um, let's say they're, they're sold, they wanna go with you, but they don't wanna sign things for the other reason that another appointment's there. You know what, ma'am, I understand that. I Guess what, I could call that agent and cancel it for you. I mean, we're all used to that. So if you wanna just sign here, I will take care of that. You don't even have to contact them. And you get it signed and you call the other agent, you're like, hey, Billy, you don't need to go tomorrow, we're signed. <laughs> But again, wow. Yeah, <laughs> Billy, Billy was not happy. But there is nothing wrong with that. Um, your goal is to get them signed that day. Now, does that mean they're still gonna go with you? 
not always. You still got to keep loving on them, taking care of them, answering every question. Don't ever assume you've got it. Okay. So the home walkthrough, that's all part of that also. But the big thing is getting there. And if, if any of you would ever want me to go with you on a listing, I'd love to. I will do my best to, to just sort of stay out of the way and help. But that's part of what we do as a team here is we help everybody. So if you are going on one and you want some backup, let's do it. Um, let's check my schedule first. So closing the deal. The, the main reason you went to their house is to get that signed. So number one, bring it with you. Go in assuming you're going to get it, but at the same time, not taking anything for granted. But I always have the copies there that I can sign, walk through them. I've even highlighted them usually. So that if they don't want to talk through all the details, they just see where the highlights are. I've already got my part of it signed. They're just signing and then we're good to go. And I tell them, I will email you a copy once I get back to the office um, and then we'll get the photo photographer lined up. And, or you can even talk to your photographer ahead of time and see when his next availability is. And you can tell him, you know what, I've got a photographer on hold. Your, your acreage is awesome. I wanna do some drone photos here. Um, also put, put doubt in their mind, make them realize that some agents are gonna use cell phones for pictures and say, you know, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna be professional. We're gonna take, we're gonna treat your house like the castle it is. I hate it when you see pictures straight up and down like this on, on a, a listing. It's like, at least do a pano slightly so it's the right size. So once you got the deal closed, you thank them. Um, you know, you're, you're a guest in their house, thank them, tell them you'll be in touch, tell them what to expect next. Okay, I will be going back to the office. Um, if you have somebody that you're handing it off to, make sure they understand the connection there. Um, you want them to realize it's a good thing. It's not that I'm too busy, I'm handing you off to somebody. It's, this is our process to take white glove care of you. Um, if you're going to be bringing something by tomorrow, or you're going to tell them when the lockbox is, but you want to set the expectations so they know what's coming next, and then you want to make sure you come through on it. Um, usually, yeah, sign a sign lockbox. You can even bring the lockbox with you. You can put it on that day so it's ready to go. What other things are here? So, hey, look at that. We're at the recap and the ahas. So we kind of took some weird routes to get here. Cool. Online, anything we need, you can either unmute yourself or chat it. Well, I froze it because I screwed up to the technology. Might be good there. Okay, so my listing form. If you will email me, mikebrown417 at kw.com, I will just respond back and attach it. I'll send you my buyer one too. Um, and again, Anything I've got, you have full permission to take my name off and make it yours. Mike Brown, 417 at kw.com. That's the joy of being Mike Brown. There are hundreds of us. Yeah, we can send that too. Um, I'll send you a shorter one we've got and a larger one, but these, seriously, Kelly Nystrom and Kelly Hunt put this together. I had like a five page one that I used and they dug into command and found all this extra stuff that has all the slick looking, my, mine was the, the junk word document looking stuff and they added all the other because they pulled it straight out of command. Um, so it's very doable to do that and add your own things. Well, I have a range, but but I've gone in before and realized, holy cow, they added a whole wing to this house or they finished the basement. And so I'm not necessarily gonna tell them, I personally am not gonna tell them a price that day because one of my things in here, Shane, you remember Bob Hopkins? Okay, I stole this phrase from him. He was, I used to work at a music store and I'd call on band directors everywhere. That's how I knew Shane, but Diagnosis without examination is malpractice. That was a line he used because I can't tell you a price until I've looked at the house. And so that also gives me another reason to touch base with them. Okay. 
Pre-questionnaire, I feel, is when you're just starting to get to know somebody. Just even that first question. I think so. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel it. That's to find out, as Mark said on his thing, how much time am I putting on you right now? Mm -hmm. You know, is this a, are we ready to list? Right. Um, or is it more of a, you know, a, a down the road type thing? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, and that was on one of those forms we pulled up, mm -hmm. those questions there. But that's more to help you know how, what is the urgency? That's the one we pulled up information with information about us. Right. Showing our stress. The listing presentation to me is basically a regurgitation of the thing you did before okay. on you mm -hmm. and info on the house. Okay. I can and so not really a comp. Not I I don't I will have like neighborhood comps, but I will not have a full market analysis. Okay. And have an urgent person who jumps this and this and gets right to I need to come I would rather go on the fly and get there right and how urgent this is for you of what you're doing is listing presentation A, appointment A, and then sort of honestly, I will usually look at and I have this huge e we'll pull it up. We're going to go in this area. That's or can we get more? I, I usually have not until I've gone back and researched. Okay. But they have signed. Yeah, if you can get them to sign and say, this is what I'll do for you, the only thing we've got to figure out is the price. Okay. But you want to get the signature and get them agreed to on you. Okay, so when I do a CMA forum, and this is a whole other class, this is ours, here's my, my basic format for it. We've completed your home. So this is the thing I emailed to them, and the yellow reminds me to fill, to change things out or to attach things. So I do an area sales attachment, which I just gave them in my listing appointment. That's the thing of the, on the neighborhood. Uh-oh. That. Okay. The area sales attachment. This is just on the neighborhood. It's a one-page CMA. Then, oh my God. I'm not good with a touchpad either. I usually have to have a mouse. And CMA. And did you know sometimes air will affect these these pads? I was under a vent one day and my mouse is going all over the place. I'm like, what's going on? Okay, area sales attachments. That's my one page CMA on the neighborhood. It also tells them active, pending, and sold. It tells them what matters. The sold homes are the ones that an appraiser looks at. So I don't care if your neighbor's listed at 900,000, it ain't sold. Then I attach the official CMA. And look, on the listing price recommendation page, you'll see that it came out at blank with a range of blank to blank. However, the CMA is based mainly on statistics. So I would recommend, and then I can put in my own number on there. But this is great news. This is the thing I learned. We will price it wherever you want because I'm not going to lose a, a listing because they. I'm telling them this should be this price. I'm happy to try higher. Here's a great line I learned from a broker at another company. If anyone can get that price for it, I can. So let's go ahead and sign and I'll get it going for you. Then I attach what's called the competition. So if my range up here says 290 to 320, I'm going back as if I'm working with a buyer and I do a like the one I did yesterday, Glendale Schools, 250 to 330 to see what I'm competing against. I send that to them also and say, here's what will, how does your house compare to these? And my blue here, that's where I insert a hyperlink from Flex, so they can actually pull up the listings and see it. Then I also do the estimated proceeds sheet. That's why I found out what their loan amount is. So now I can tell them how much to expect to get off of it, and they know what costs are involved from day one. And then it says, 
We know there's a lot of information. Please let us know if you have any questions. So I will typically, if it's somebody I know that's, you know, normal age, I will email this to them. And five minutes later, I call them and I say, hey, I just sent you all the info on your house, but I'd still love to come visit with you as soon as I can. Um, but most people are happy with it like this. I just don't want to stop the conversation. This is, I've gone to the house. I've looked through it. I've come back with my notes. I've done a full CMA, for example. Usually, sometimes I haven't yet. I know. Here's my CMAs. Oh, I'm under the wrong me. Hold on. I got to change personalities real quick. But I do it in insane. And this, those of you got to leave, thanks for coming today, and we'll get stuff emailed to you. I know we're running long. Quit super using. If you don't know what super using is, don't worry. Do we really? Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep going on this stuff. Aha. Uh -huh. CMAs. Okay, the one I did the other day. Okay. Here's the way my CMAs look when I'm done with them. And I've, it's, the format's not quite right because I'm in the middle of changing picture sizes. This will download in a second. And this can be done straight out of Flex. Fair to market analysis. That's a picture of the house. It has the owner's names on it. It shows a, actually, it shows our picture. Aren't we pretty? That, I got to get that format wrong. That's supposed to fit on this page, and I don't know why it jumped. Okay, this is just like an appraisal. So here's the dot or the pin is my subject. The blues are the comps I used. It tells when they closed. Here's my subject property. It tells all the info. This is supposed to be on the same page. I don't know why it's doing that. But this is all pulled straight from Flex. And then... Here are my comparables. So on everyone, just like an appraisal, my subject is here, comp, comp, comp. It'll show normal prices. The column here is where I've made adjustments, which I strongly recommend you do not do, and your broker recommends you do not do that too. But I do make adjustments. See, see how this says, well, well our house is worth 16000 more than that one. Or is it worth 4,500 less? I have no authority to do that. <laughs> but it's just sort of on experience and, and what I've done with things. So, okay, so it will come out looking just like an appraisal. There's the other three comps. It'll show all the statistical analysis of it. Usually I'm, usually I'm uh, PDFing it and emailing it to them. Uh, but if I am meeting with somebody in person, I will. Price analysis. So on my comps, green is list. That is what it sold for. The dot is where, did, where I adjusted it to. So you can see this is showing this house should be median price 313. But you can see the adjustments I've done on here. You have enough for everybody, Mark? Are you sharing? You got enough for everybody? But what I love on this CMA, get to the bottom page. Look, it will show you a recommended price and a low and a high. So I, I tell him, this is what it says based on these adjustments, but we're in a range from here to here. And I gave, this is a, this one's not going to be listed. It's a long story. They just needed a value on it for some refinancing. So this will show all this on here. And I'll show you some. So if I'm editing this, like here's my cover page. I'm back into Flex. My next step is, there's my subject property. Here's where I added comps. Mouse, I should have brought that down. Here's where you do adjustments, which I strongly recommend you don't do. So like on bedrooms, 
Well, my house had five. Well, that one only had three. We must be worth 16,000 more. This one only had four. And these are just ballpark numbers I use. But then it does a summary. Here's my finish, oops, recommendation. You can make the recommendation change some. Like, typically I'll do it that I want a 3% range. I hit 3% and recalculate. Now it's telling me this range should be 303 to 322. But on this one for a refinance for some things they were doing, I need a wider range. Let's say I realize, holy crap, that's not the price I want, 250. You can do all this before you print it off. Okay, but 303 to 322. So I went back on this one, a quick search, leave. I don't want my saves. So my, my biggest check to double check my price is what I call the competition. So that range was telling me, what was it? 289 to 330. And I know it was in Glendale schools and all Springfield schools are under SGF, then whatever school it is. In that range, I have five houses available. So if I list this house at 313, here's the five houses we're competing against. So I will make this into a PDF form. I'll go to CMA, download PDF. And I will, this. So I will send this as what I call the competition because I want them to look at this and go, well, if I price it 319 and this house is much smaller, I have a better chance of selling. But the other thing I'll do, I don't know if you all know how to do this. You select, you change this, actually you can do it here. Share, you can share the selected emails and make a permalink. So I can control copy that and email that, it'll pop up all these five listings for them. So that way they can actually look at the houses so they realize, well, yeah, my, my master bedroom doesn't have a bathroom, so it's not as good as this one. But the big thing to me in justifying a price is showing that you know how to do research and that you're coming from a good knowledge point. And I'm always happy to try and, again, I am not official. I'm not an appraiser. I'm not any of that. But I usually can get pretty darn close on these things. But right now, like I said, we've been taking whatever the sales price says and adding 20% to it. And that's about where it was selling two weeks ago. Now it's a whole different market. But so that's back to that page though. That is my whole process. I send them overload of information and then I call them to talk through it. I would rather personally go back again, talk with them, have the lockbox, have the sign and say, here's where I see is the price. Sometimes I'll do that. Um, I always, I have a digital tape measure too. I prefer to measure rooms. I want that on the listing because I used to deal with a lot of people who needed to know where to put their grand piano or, you know, what about our 17 foot couch? And the people looking at those kind of homes want to know the size of the rooms. So I would do my digital measuring while I'm meeting up with them to do this, put the lockbox on, put the sign and schedule the photographer. I love Matt Schmidley. Um, several reasons. Number one, um, there's one guy in town who, whose pictures I don't like, and I'm not, not going to say his name, but I call them munchkin pictures because they're all done from like waist high. And I'm like, I'm not that short. And mats are at a normal level. It's not way up here, but it just seems to be a better view. He also does this thing called eye guide, which is like a Matterport, but I like it better. And he's an agent with a lockbox key. So I don't have to go back and meet him. I can schedule him and he'll go when he wants to. Let's find. Oh, another thing Matt does, I'll pull this up. You may need a lake house, by the way. Yeah. Change user again. Oh, did you? Lake view, fixer upper. They need some love, but, okay. So here's another thing Matt can do. My listings, Monterey Drive, Sunset Cove. Check this last photo he's got for me. He does drone stuff too. 
He's a Murney agent, so is his mom. We need to get him over here. No. Check that. I know it's a hard view on there, but he has software that will do the square footage. Oh, wow. And it measures it for you. So um, for that extra thing, like this, this house was normal pictures, drone, and this. I think I paid 225 But this, so it's hard to read. I need to do a PDF on two. Old listing showed 4,700 square feet. It's actually 3,900. Um, because the old listing, I think, included the garage. But Matt can do this. He also does this thing called iGuide, which, um, what was the house I sold? I'm trying to remember. Give me a second. Oh, you know what? It's in here. Oh, that's another cool thing that we always add in this. Sales for 2020. So once you've got, keep track of your sales, put it on an Excel sheet so that later on you can put that in because that, um, and you'll see everything on here. Like next year's, we'll show everything from a $5,500 to a $600,000 house. But I always tell people we can do every level for you. I'm going to find that, I promise. 9360 Lookout Lane. <laughs> Here's another thing I love on cert, on Flex. I, I rarely use this search bar up here, the shortcut one. I'm faster without it. So I just put in the address. It brought up every time this house has been listed. Then if I sort it by number, it brings up the top one that I'm looking for. Now a little bit of the code. So you know this, um, if it has a one in front, used to we were nine different board of realtors. So GSBOR, when this was all, when they were all merged together, we had to combine them number of systems somehow. So anything with a one at the beginning was GSBOR. Anything with a three at the beginning was Tri Lakes. I don't remember what number two was. So, but on old GSBOR, like 113 meant this was listed in 2013, 2009, 2008. When we went to the sixes, that's where all of them were merged together and now it just goes numerically. So if you're looking at something, you're wondering why is the numbering system the way it is? That's why. Okay, so here's Lookout Lane. Photos. Next one. This is the eye guide that I love. So it will show the floor plan over here, but then I can scroll up, I can look up, I can look down, I can go all the way around, I can go to the next dot in that room, but at the same time, it shows me where I am over here, or if I want to jump to the sunroom. And just click on that. Uh huh. Yeah. I like this, especially on unique shaped homes. Like this one's weird. Not weird. Um, oh, by the way, marketing remarks. Kiss of kiss of death is unique. Don't use the word unique, one of a kind, anything like that. An appraiser is like, oh crap, how am I going to find something to compare this to? So don't use unique, one of a kind, that kind of stuff. But for example, this is the let's go to the master bathroom. Okay, there's your master tub. There's a door, and there's your driveway. <laughs> but you, but you're on. You're on top of a hill here um, where no one can get around you. But that's the eye guide that Matt does also. So that's something you can tell your people too. I'm gonna to use a professional photographer. We can do this on a unique house. The reason we did the square footage one instead of this on the, the Monterey house, Monterey's a mess. Um, so we didn't wanna show pictures of all of the rooms. I mean, it's there's a long story on how a father was redoing it and passed away and some son moved in. Apparently he had a lot of marijuana hidden because we found the furnace pulled apart to get to some of the stash and yeah, but it's great view and it's going to be a great house for somebody. So sunset cove at like at a table rod. Yeah. They, they throw away lots of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, we're afraid of that. But, but that, that's a couple other things I, I recommend too. Get it like uh, photographers, appraisers, all these people, build a relationship with them too. Because this is the more you're friendly and helpful with people, it's going to help you down the road also. Okay, so in conclusion, <laughs> let's get back to where we were from current slide. We'll see what else we had on here. Ahas to achievement, daily success habits. Okay, so you're supposed to be calling 10 people a day, correct? Mm -hmm. Or adding 10 to your database. I will, okay, so here's, here's the story on me. I came over to Keller Williams December 2019. Um, Dan Holt has been talking to me forever about becoming part of the leadership. I came over and I thought, okay, I'll sell a house here or there on my time side, you know, and just keep doing this. The people I've dealt with in the past kept calling. Database is the secret. I was not marketing. I was not selling anybody. I accidentally sold 9 million in sales last year because these people who I've dealt with and taken care of remembered me and called back. And that's, I can't emphasize that more than, that's the biggest thing. The more you take care of people and the more you stay in touch with them, your business will thrive. And it doesn't feel like a business. It feels like a big community. Um, you know, for example, last year, one cool thing we were able to do, um, I love the arts and I, I go to little theater all the time. During Christmas show, we were able to rent out the balcony for our clients. Very cheap because of COVID. I can't do it this year because it's back to normal price. But the fact that we had... The entire balcony, another company, a big company was downstairs. We were upstairs and all of our clients had a special thing for It's a Wonderful Life. And as they left, we had a little bell ornament that said It's a Wonderful But the more you can pull, uh, pour into your people, what's funny, how many of you have been here less, anybody here last, last Thanksgiving? Okay, this place, you, you were here? Okay, were you in the building much right around Thanksgiving? Okay, Mark Stewart, uh, Holt Group, Adam Grady, Susan Stowe, and somebody else all did pie giveaways to their people. And so there were like pie caravans on every side of this building. And what they do, this is brilliant. Uh, this is the way Dan's group did it. They contacted everybody in their database and said, hey, we've got a free pie for you for Thanksgiving. Pick up is this time, do you want pumpkin or whatever? And they'd come through the, and they had a little drive through thing set up. And they said, hey, here's the pie. If you have a referral for us, we got a can of, of whipped cream for you too. And they got like 30 referrals on possible listings and that's a tradition. So there are people every year are like, okay, we got to think of somebody so we can get that extra whipped cream. So a $2 thing of whipped cream and an $8 pie gets them, you know, a house listing. But it's, it's all about connecting with your people. It is not a sales business. It's a service business. And the more you do that, it will grow beyond your wildest means. Okay, 10 handwritten notes, write better than I do. 10 home previews per week. Uh, so are you all going out and looking at houses? Okay, we used to do what's called caravan. Every Tuesday, we'd go out and look at all the new listings. Of course, they're gone before you can get to them right now. But there is a way in Flex to draw out a map and get them organized. So if you ever want help with that, um, that's real easy to do, and you can sort them and get a geographic map put together to get to houses fast. But that's the best thing is learning inventory. I would especially say, if you can, do that in your own neighborhood. Become the master of your area. Um, and then the, as how many of your neighborhoods have a Facebook group? How many of your neighbor? Okay. If your neighborhood doesn't have a Facebook group, start one. Because then Jacqueline Durbin, a Murney realtor, did it in my neighborhood. I'm still <laughs> mad at her. But guess what? All the neighborhood conversations go through that. And who's in charge of it? Jacqueline is. Okay. So the more you can be the expert, and it doesn't mean about houses every moment, it means about everything in general, that's where, where it all comes from. So it's a slow process to get things going, but the more you can build your database, it pays off down the road. Scripts. I think you've got to listen to the scripts in there. Um, the best script I ever saw was when somebody comes to your door at Halloween, what do they say? That's a script. They didn't, they had to learn that. It gets an automatic response. Scripting is learning to say the same thing. Hey, how you doing? Fine. We're all scripted to say fine. Ch change the way you say something. It's funny to, like my daughter, 
every time I say, have a great day, her, her scripted word is, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> and so that's become our funny thing now. Or, you know, don't, don't tell me what to do on that. So scripting is what gives you comfort because you know what to say. So just practice over and over. If you don't have a script partner, try and find somebody. Um, it, it just, it helps you so much because it helps you become comfortable with what you're saying. Okay, so we're supposed to go and, and uh, do not call people you're not supposed to. You're supposed to say that every time. Don't get sued, don't get the company sued. Yes, exactly. All right, see if there's anything else on here we need. Get help on Command Connect. Um, I, my notes disappeared because I had to start screen sharing the other way. And the success list. So there's a, a survey too if you want to do that. You probably don't. I did a terrible job on today. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, please realize that's my main job is to help you all with anything, especially when you're new on learning these things. Don't try and recreate from the beginning. We've probably got something you can take and steal and make your own. But any other questions online? I think we lost most of them already. No, we didn't. Eight of them are still there. Of course, I'm three. One, two, three. And then tomorrow's class is what? Probably the same with Austin. It'll be much more organized and it'll be much better, I promise. Put me on a scaffolding at a marching field. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> all right. Those of you online, we're getting ready to shut it down. Thank you all, everybody. I can stop the recording.